Hey everybody, welcome back to Smith Party of Six. Today we are continuing our curriculum pick series. I have already done our family curriculum picks and our kindergarten ones. So if you haven't checked those out, I will go ahead and put them down in the description box. But today we are going to focus on second grade curriculum picks. So my daughter Arwen, who I used to post videos of back when she was just two years old and I started homeschooling with her, She's now in second grade, which is absolutely insane. So we've been doing this for a little while with her now. She's been homeschooled from the beginning, has never been in public school, uh, but last year was our first year doing Ambleside. And so she did year one of Ambleside last year when she was a first grader. And so this year she's doing year two of Ambleside. So I'm just gonna go down through the list and talk about the different books that we'll be using, what we're doing for math, all that kinds of stuff, um, separate resources that I pulled in that Ambleside doesn't use, that sort of thing. So I will go ahead and start off with our curriculum choice for math, since um, if you watched the last video on our kindergarten choices, you would have already seen it. This is the Charlotte Mason Elementary Arithmetic Series. It is available through Simply Charlotte Mason, and this is what we are using this year. We actually have a couple weeks of school under our belt now, so we've been using this, and I really, really like it. It combines a lot of elements from other math curriculums that I have enjoyed, but it's very simple, straightforward math. And so for the foreseeable future, at least, I do think that we can stick with this one. We have not run into any snags. It seems like a really, really good fit for our family. I might, uh, toward the end of our school year, go ahead and do like a review video after we've had a long while to use it just to kind of go more in depth with it. But we really like this one so far. And for all of their different math options, you need a box of manipulatives, which they sell on their site. But for book one, I just went ahead and put together our own box. And so that's what I've got right here. It's just got like buttons. I mean, most of the stuff we had laying around already. Craft sticks, beans, and then they need pipe cleaners and lacing cords. So I just did those in two different colors because I have two of my kids in book one right now. Aspen is at the very beginning of book one. I just have his in blue because that's his favorite color. And Arwen's favorite color is pink and she's later on in the book. So I have those for her. Um, the lacing cords for each of them. You need like some math number cards. And so we already had some of those from when we used the old Good and Beautiful Math. So I was like, yeah, I can just reuse all of this stuff um, and then you also need like money, which I already had. We have like a little school tray that we have like money and different stuff in for them to use during math. And so, yeah, we already had pretty much everything that we needed from off the list. So it was kind of one of those things. It's like, I don't really need to purchase all this stuff, which made it a lot cheaper. The book itself, I think, is $50 if I'm not mistaken and I'll go ahead and pop that up on the screen for you guys. And in addition to that you need a math notebook and a slate for each child. Our slate is starting to look a little grimy right here. I need to clean it off. But this is the slate that they sell on their site. It's blank on one side and it's gridded on the other. I haven't used the gridded side too much with the younger kids yet because even in their gridded math notebook here, this is Arwen's, you'll see that the grid boxes are a lot bigger than they are on the board. The board size is more like the same one for the older kids. So the older kids have been using the gridded side of theirs, but the younger kids, I've just been using the blank side whenever they need their slate for lessons. And you just put things in their math notebook as it tells you along the way. So like different numbers that they've been working on in the tens and the ones and like equations and stuff whenever it tells you to go ahead and write one in the math notebook. So next up on my list is history. The history book choices for Ambleside for year two include several different ones. Uh, first up, Child's History of the World. If you watched our end of the year review from last year uh, with our favorite and least favorite books, you'll know that this was one of the least favorite, at least for Elijah, and it wasn't really one of my favorites either. I'm still going ahead and doing the chapters that they suggest with Arwen whenever it comes up. But honestly, if there's ever a week that's too and this is one of the things that we have to get through that week, I will just take it off of the list. It's not my top priority book by any means. This year, she also starts This Country of Ours. She hasn't gotten to any of those readings yet in these first couple of weeks. This is one of Elijah's absolute favorite books. 
We'll see how Arwen feels about it. She is not one of my kids who's super into history. My real history buff is Elijah, but we'll see how she ends up taking to this book. I actually really like it too. It is a book all about um, how this country of ours, our country, the United States started. It starts in the beginning with Vikings and then moves on to explorers and the colonies and all of that. Um, Elijah, even though he started this last year and was already a good bit of the way through the book, is only about that far. So not even halfway through this book yet. It is a very big one and they use it over multiple years of um, the homeschooling journey. Then in the history category, she is also still in our island story. Now this is one of her personal least favorite, she says from last year. However, I will say that when we get into a story, she's really into it. Like right now we're reading about William the Conqueror and she was completely invested in the story. So I feel like maybe she dislikes the idea of history, but once she's actually reading it, it's fine. I don't know. I find this book really interesting. British history is not something that I remember learning very much about in school and maybe I did but I just wasn't paying attention. History was not my favorite subject in school at all but it feels like so much of it was left out in public school like there was just a lot that they didn't focus on um, particularly anything pertaining to God and it's like once you put back in that missing puzzle piece history kind of clicks and it becomes interesting. So I've actually really enjoyed all of the history selections just in general. Also for history in a Charlotte Mason education you will often hear about a book of centuries. Books of centuries really kind of start when the child hits what's form two or around like fourth or fifth grade. So my oldest son, Elijah, he uses a book of centuries. Everyone else still uses a timeline. With our timelines, I want them to be able to see the flow of time very easily in just a glance. So I will take two pieces of paper, tape them together like long ways, and then I accordion fold them. And on each panel of the accordion fold, I have another century. Okay, so here, is Arwen's timeline. So our first century that we have is 900 to 1000. And then we're just going to kind of go on from there 1000 to 1100, all the way up the different panels until we get to um, 1500 to 1600. So I try to look at all of the dates that she might learn about throughout the year and make sure that they are all represented somewhere on the timeline so that she has a space for all the different people and events that she's learning about. And then she can just throw those on there as she goes. So we have Richard the Little Duke over here. And then we have some stuff that she's learning about from Island Story here so far. And that's everything that she's got on her timeline right now. So kind of tied in with history, Ambleside also does biography where we're learning about famous people from different points in history. And so one of the threads that continues throughout multiple Ambleside years is Trial and Triumph and it is a church history book. So we started this book whenever I actually became really interested in church history anyways. It was just I was at a point theologically where I just needed to know like how did we get from where the apostles were to where we are now with all the different denominations, with all these different beliefs? I don't understand how we fractured and fragmented so much. And I knew about a few little things along the way, but not the majority of it. And so this has been a really good read for us. I will say that I know from the Ambleside Facebook group that there are lots of Catholic families who don't necessarily love this book and feel like it paints some Roman Catholics from history in a negative light. I still think that this is a worthwhile read and I would not be opposed to reading things from a more Roman Catholic perspective, though I am most definitely Protestant. Also in the biography category, we have The Little Duke. It is the story of um, how a little boy named Richard became the Duke of Normandy and the things that happened to him after that. So I've already read this last year with Alexia. We really fell in love with little Richard here. It's a book that can be kind of hard in the beginning to kind of dig down in there and connect with the language, but I have found it a lot easier this year. I think because I wasn't familiar with it yet last year, we were just diving right into Ambleside and a lot of the literature is very rich. So it was like, 
I was trying to just plow through in the beginning. And then as we went on, it kind of got a little bit easier to understand and grasp and really get invested in the story. So if you pick this book up, my recommendation is to try to pre-read it before you start reading it with your child so you can go ahead and get a feel for it. And if you can't, then at least just try to keep going. Don't stop partway through because I was tempted at times, like, is she even getting anything out of this? But by the end, she most definitely did. And I wouldn't even say by the end. Probably about halfway through the book is when we started really, really grasping it and enjoying his story. This year, since I already had experience with the book, I already know everything that's going to happen. It's been a lot easier for me to help Arwen with it. I also uh, found online some little Duke coloring sheets. I think that those were in the Ambleside forum, like another mom had posted and shared them. And if you go on their website, there is so much on the forum that other moms have shared, just like different resources and stuff. So we also have like some little Duke coloring sheets with like different scenes um, that they're talking about in the book that then I'll print off for her and she can kind of color those in either while she's listening, if she's able to multitask during or afterward when she's narrated. And I think that sometimes pictures can kind of help our brain to uh, latch on to certain ideas and certain stories just a little bit better. So little Duke will last for the first two terms. And then in the final term, we'll be doing a little Joan of Arc picture book. I don't currently have that one. Last year with Lexi, we just ended up skipping it. But this year I do want to do it with Arwen. So it's something that I'll probably order when it gets a little bit closer to term three. All right, our next category is going to be natural history or science as we might think of it. In the early years, Charlotte Mason really focuses more on nature, observing those things around you in nature. And so with Ambleside, they pull in these books by Thornton Burgess in the early years. So last year, Arwen had Burgess's bird book, so specifically different birds that we might see even in our area. And this year she is doing the Burgess animal book. So it starts out with Peter Rabbit and his cousin Jumper the Hare, and then it kind of goes on from there as Mother Nature is teaching them about different animals in their own family, and then it kind of branches off from there. And we learn about lots of different animals in the forest, in the meadow, and other areas right around um, where they live. And so most of the animals talked about in this book are animals that that we could see here at our home in West Virginia. And so she's learning about things in her surroundings as well. With this book, sometimes it might, especially when first starting, it might feel jarring for us Christians to hear this character of Mother Nature. I know that some people get very off put by things like that. I definitely don't see this book as anything that's sort of like worshiping nature or the earth or anything like that. It's just a character to bring this to life for children. In the book, Mother Nature does mention how she doesn't do anything arbitrarily and that when she gives an animal something, it's always for a purpose. So I did pause at that line to kind of talk with Arwen for just a second and just kind of remind her that this is just a story and that Mother Nature is just a character. And I asked her, so who does actually give animals the things that they have? And of course she knows that that's God. The foundation for our entire homeschool is God. And so my kids definitely know who the creator actually is. So we're able to still read stories like this and get much out of it. And I think that that's only mentioned maybe like a couple times throughout the book. It's definitely not a focus that she like is giving the animals all of these things. And like I said, it doesn't feel like worship of nature or anything like that. We mainly use it just to learn about the animals. And then afterwards, I have these little sheets that she narrates on. So there's a box at the top for her to draw a picture of the animal. Then down underneath, she writes the animal's name and then she writes down any of the things that she has learned about that specific type of animal. So I think with things like this, that can be a little bit more controversial. And we'll also talk about this when uh, we get to the whole mythology section with my oldest, Elijah. So with any of the things like this, it can be hard for Christians to kind of know what to do, but I think a lot of it also depends on how you as the parent are framing it and using this as just a tool. But of course, if you feel uncomfortable with something like that, that's why I like to mention it in the video, just so if you don't like it at all, you don't want anything to do with it, then you can just steer clear. Another thing that we use for natural history is of course, each student has their own nature journal or their own nature notebook. In it, they have like their different nature drawings 
Got a bird on there. Um, and usually some notes that go along with it too. I don't push quite as much with Arwen and making sure that she takes lots of notes. I do with the older kids. Um, you know, I ask them to kind of think about each thing. Here's one from over the summer nature study that we were doing with our friends. So, you know, they can actually tape things in there from nature. They can draw, they can take notes, um, all that sort of thing, just to help them remember what they've studied in nature. So the other book that's listed on the actual schedule as a natural history book, I kind of count it more as a geography book, um, is Tree in the Trail. And then later on throughout the year, that gets switched out for Seabird whenever they're done with this. So these are both Hauling Sea Hauling books. And last year, her favorite book, Paddle to the Sea, was written by Hauling Sea Hauling. So we've started Tree in the Trail so far, and she is definitely enjoying it. I don't know if she necessarily has quite as much of a connection with this book as she did with Paddle to the Sea, but she still really likes it so far. And I do say that it feels a little bit more like geography because we are kind of learning about a specific place and um, we learn some geography words like buttes and we have a map where she is kind of tracing this Santa Fe trail as we go along throughout the book. So to me, even though it's listed on the schedule under natural history, it definitely feels a little bit more like geography. Seabird, I can see how it would kind of go either way, even maybe more of like a historical social study type of book for Seabird. But those are both definitely fun. And I can show you, for example, in in chapter six, here are some of the illustrations off to the side. He always has such beautiful work in there. And like even little notes talking about, you know, when you cut open a tree and see in its rings. So in that way, it's definitely like a natural history, but that's not the majority of the book focusing on things like this. Um, so he, he just makes all these little notes along the way and we get really beautiful illustrations of things going on in the story. And that's how every chapter is set up. It's just a one page chapter with some extra little notes off to the side and a beautiful illustration to see. They're just very simple books. Okay, so I'm going to let that go ahead and lead us straight into geography. For geography, we have two main books from Ambleside that we're using. So one of them I only have a Kindle copy of, and that was actually written by Charlotte Mason herself, and it's called Elementary Geography. Again, it's over several years, just some chapters here and there, not doing it every week. That also kind of alternates with a book by C.C. Long, which I do have. So this book is called Home Geography. Just very simple lessons in here, usually just one or two pages long, like we recently talked about about the compass and how to use it, which she has seen a compass before. We actually bring them out on our nature hikes with us just for fun so that they kind of learn how to use it and where they're going and that sort of thing. So very just simple and short lessons in there. Both of those books really focus on things more like I call it physical geography. I don't know if that would be the right term. So learning like why there's day and night, why certain countries are hot and certain countries are cold, why there are the different seasons, uh, how to use a compass, this, how to make a map starting with like a plan of our schoolroom even just to kind of see okay this is how it would be done so then when we look at a map that's the same type of uh, principles that are being followed to make that map just like very basic type of geography things to kind of give them a good overview of what geography is so then in addition to that I always have my kids do some separate map work for her this year she is still working on the United States of America Elijah and Alexia finished that last year knowing where all the states were and everything. And so this year they've moved on to specifically West Virginia. I know Charlotte Mason actually does it opposite of that. She would say to start out close to where you are, kind of focusing on the geography of your specific area, and then maybe branch out to your town and then branch out further to your county and then to your state and then to your country and then the continent and then the world. So she starts out small and goes big, um, which I definitely see the benefits of that. But I also just kind of wanted them to have like a basic understanding of the world around them and especially our country. And so I always start them off with the United States. So for that this year, in addition to kind of memorizing where the states are, we're actually learning about the states. One of the books that we have, a friend just ended up giving to me one day, it's called The United States of America, a state-by-state -state guide. This is what each of the pages looks like in there 
there. So there's the shape of the state so they can see what it looks like. And it's kind of like the physical map of it where you can see where the major mountains and rivers and things like that are. And then there's different things all about the state going around it that we can learn about each one. And the second book that we're using is 50 Adventures in the 50 States. This book kind of focuses more on something specific in that state that you could see. So it kind of feels more like you're there type of thing. So each one just has a really nice two page illustration. And then dotted throughout there are facts about that specific place. So like this one is in South Dakota. And the main word box over here says search for fossils and it gives kind of like a blurb about what this would be and then other little things about it all over the page in random places. How I structure that basically if she doesn't have a chapter from the Charlotte Mason book or from the CC Long home geography book then she will have two states that week. So for example on the first week of not having uh, those other geography books, she did Alabama and Alaska. So on one day we focused on Alabama and the other day of the week that we were doing geography, we focused on Alaska and just read from both of those books. And she has a little map in her student binder that she colored each of those states and um, wrote which state that it was. Another geography resource that I will just mention really quickly is MapTrek. So I actually found this through a friend of a friend. So it comes with the MapTrek Atlas and then MapTrek Outlines. So everything that's in the Atlas you can do in an outline that doesn't have any of like the names of anything filled in on it. So for example, how Arwen had a tree in the trail, there's actually a map in this book that shows the trail expansion in the USA. And one of the things on there is the Santa Fe Trail. Now it doesn't have any of the towns or anything like that marked on it. So what we did, I copied this because I wanna be able to reuse it for Aspen. Uh, so I just made a copy of this and I put it into her student binder in the map section and we marked where the tree would be on this Santa Fe trail. And then as we go along and we hear about different things, then we can mark those on the trail as well. So that makes it super simple. And there were several of those in there that were actually really relevant for us. Like there's one in there for Marco Polo's travels, which is something that Alexia is studying. And there's some of like the colonies in there, which Elijah is studying. So if you don't want to necessarily scour the internet for maps, I mean, you can, but this might be a good resource for you if you feel like you're gonna need lots of different maps throughout the years. And you can see I have so many of them marked <laughs> with sticky notes. All right, so next up is the literature category. This is one of my favorite things. We just have so much fun with a lot of the uh, literature selections over on Ambleside. So one of them is Tales from Shakespeare. This one is not new to us. She had started with it last year, like she did like Midsummer Night's Dream, just a couple of um, different things like that. So this year we're continuing in Tales from Shakespeare. Right now she is reading um, Two Gentlemen of Verona. Then she'll have Romeo and Juliet, All's Well That Ends Well, Cymbeline, Macbeth, and Comedy of Errors. So before anyone goes freaking out hearing all of those names, Tales from Shakespeare is made specifically for children. So it takes the stories of Shakespeare and it takes out a lot of the certain elements that you would not want. So for example, Romeo and Juliet, there's some risque stuff in Romeo and Juliet. You're not gonna actually find that in Tales from Shakespeare. So it acquaints them with the stories from Shakespeare without some of the extra stuff in there. And it's also not in play format in this book. It's just in normal prose type of format, just telling the story. The language, I will say, is still super rich, but I find that it's really dependent on how I'm reading it that kind of helps their comprehension. So this isn't something that I have Arwen like read to me instead I'm reading this to her because the language is like I said rich and so as long as I understand what I'm reading and I'm putting that inflection into it I get really into reading these stories to my kids like I do different voices and everything so as long as I am putting different inflection and stuff into it then she's able to easily grasp things more without me having to stop every few words and say and this word means this that's not always necessary 
with some words it is sometimes she'll kind of stop me and go what does that mean and then I can explain it to her that's perfectly fine but I don't ever want to make it to where I'm basically just lecturing her through the book and then it's becoming more of me talking than letting the book speak for itself so that's just a little tip with that if you're the one reading it then it makes it a lot easier and you know sometimes even us moms again we might want to familiarize ourselves with some of this because our culture is so far removed from this way of speaking that sometimes even for us we need to kind of go through it first especially if we're just starting out we might want to go through it first to familiarize ourselves with the story and kind of grasp what it's saying and then be able to read it with our kids but even if you just do that for the first couple of them you'll really get used to the flow of it and the formation of the speech in there now I got these <laughs> to go along with Tales from Shakespeare. Kind of like the same idea with Little Duke. Like, oh, this is specifically a coloring book of Tales from Shakespeare. So it must be the different stories from Tales from Shakespeare. And it'll have like the different scenes in there and stuff or the different characters so that they can kind of get like a mental image of who these characters are. Um, <laughs> I don't know that this is actually the best resource. It didn't have any pictures or anything from the inside to show me whenever I went to order it. It was only $5. And so I was like, I'll go ahead and take a chance on this. I don't really recommend it. It's not the greatest. Most of the pictures from the actual tale are pretty dark. And then there's just like these other random pictures that don't have much to do with anything. Um, sprinkled all throughout. Like it's just, I don't recommend it. <laughs> but you know, there are a few in there that maybe we can can kind of use. So for a lot of our books, I use character cards for my kids, which I can put a link down below to where I got them from. So I'll use character cards for them that uh, has again a little box where they can make their own drawing of what they think that character looks like. It has a spot for the character's name and then there's some blanks down below where they can write just like a little snippet about the character to help jog their memory of who this is. So for example in Two Gentlemen from Verona, Arwen had Proteus and Valentine as the two main characters and then there's Julia and underneath in the blurb she could have written which I think that she did write Proteus's love. And for the lady Sylvia, she wrote Valentine's love and just different things like that um, to kind of keep the different characters straight. Now, also along the lines of Shakespeare, one of my friends actually found this book at our local public library and it is a pop-up Shakespeare book. It just is so fun. The kids have pulled it down several times to kind of check it out. So it talks about William Shakespeare himself and the time that he lived in. And there's all these little like fold down flaps and different things with just information all over the place. There's also stuff about each of his shows. So for example, here is the pop up that has Midsummer Night's Dream on it. And on the other side is Twelfth Night. So there's one for each of the different shows, at least that we would be reading about, As You Like It and Merchant of Venice there on the back. Um, so it separates it, like the comedies on one part, histories on the next, romances. So on here you have like Winter's Tale and Cymbeline and The Tempest, things like that. And then of course the tragedies, which he is known for Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, all kinds of different shows on that one, Hamlet. So anyways, this was just kind of a fun resource. You might want to check for it at your public library, or I mean, even if you would want to purchase it, I can link it down below in the description box. Which by the way, everything that I mentioned during these videos, I tried to link down there just so you can easily find them. All right, so in addition to Shakespeare plays throughout the year, we also have parables from nature. So they're not actually reading like a Shakespeare and a parable from nature all at the same time. It kind of alternates them. So we might read a certain tale from Shakespeare for a couple of weeks and then have a little break and then read a parable from nature for a week or two after that. So this one is actually one of my absolute favorite books that we read from. I'm not gonna lie, some of the stuff will go over their heads and then they'll grasp some of it. It's just kind of their age, where they're at. I have found that my kids cannot really fully get 
every message that I get from these parables, but that's okay because they're still getting some stuff on their level as well. So each of these stories, as it says in the title, it, it takes something from nature and it makes it into a parable lesson that we can apply to our own lives as well. I cry <laughs> at so many of these. It's not even funny. They're so relatable and there's so much depth there. I'm like, this is beautiful. And my kids are like, why is our mom crying all the time? Uh, so anyways, yeah, I recommend this book. <laughs> also in the literature category for each term, they have a different chapter book. So term one is Understood Betsy, which we absolutely love. This is such a good book. It's really one where you get to watch the main character grow from kind of like this nervous, sad, sickly, anxious little child to someone who is healthy and strong and competent and confident in herself. It's just really, really a beautiful story. We absolutely love it. The term two chapter book is The Wind in the Willows, of course, a classic. And then term three is Robin Hood. I don't actually have a physical copy of that one right now. It's one of the other ones that I will probably order when we get closer to the actual time to read it. And then I actually added some for literature this year that's not on the schedule. It's really just two of them and we don't read them at the same time. But Arwen wanted to start the Little House series this year. The other kids have read these two Little House books with me. Lexi's reading the third right now. And so Arwen wanted to also have that same experience. And so we have started on Little House in the Big Woods. So she'll read this one throughout all of term one. And then we'll spend term two and three on Farmer Boy. It's a little bit a little bit thicker and those are always fun it's just very wholesome and sweet and that she can also read as well so like we take turns reading back and forth when it comes to these they're a little bit more simple for her to be able to read okay so in addition to that stuff every year Ambleside also picks poets so for the year two poets in term one we read poems from Walter de la Mer in term two we focus on Eugene Field and James Whitcomb Riley I will say from last year I did not necessarily love James Whitcomb Riley's writing style. Uh, it can be super fun. I would rather listen to someone else read it who really has the flow down. It's harder for me to do. He writes oftentimes in a very like, it's honestly kind of an Appalachian type of accent. So being from West Virginia, I should be fine with that. But it's really hard when I'm looking at the words on the page, I'm trying to figure out how it's actually supposed to sound. So when you get there, I would familiarize yourself with the poems before just jumping in. A couple of them they have videos for that you can click the link to go to YouTube and listen to someone else reading it. Uh, I enjoyed that a little bit more <laughs> than me having to figure out what's he trying to say? But anyways, the poems themselves were still very good. It was just my brain did not connect with the written accent on the page. And then in term three, we read Christina Rossetti poems, which of course hers are short, but very sweet and beautiful. All right, so last but not least, I just have a few other odds and ends for things that we use along the way. So we have the entire set of these McGuffey's Eclectic Readers. So I will occasionally pull these out for kind of like a phonics reading type lesson or for her also spelling. I know that that's something that's not really necessary a lot of times with the Charlotte Mason education, but I do think that certain kids need more practice with things than others. So I just really like the style of these. It's easy to practice words like to kind of help her with learning spelling patterns and stuff like that. Uh, so she is in the first reader this year year. Then of course we also do handwriting and copy work. She is currently at the very end of her handwriting level one book from last year. We do use the good and the beautiful still for a lot of handwriting stuff. And so she's finishing up this book and then we'll start on the level two handwriting book. And of course we also do copy work. So for that I will just have them pick their own favorite. Sometimes if I really really love a specific thing I might pick it for them and say okay this is going to be your copy work for today. But normally I 
I let them choose. Um, and so three times a week, they do copy work. Two times a week, they do handwriting. And they'll just choose like a sentence or two that they, that really kind of jumped out at them or that they felt was really significant from something that they read either that day or the day before. And they'll use that for their copy work. My kids also do drawing lessons. And we have done that so far through The Good and the Beautiful. They have uh, one that's specifically trees that we also have in there, but they've been working through the um, drawing vintage images books. So Arwen is in level two of those books right now. And so the things in here still keep it fairly basic, but it's like a step-by-step -step type of guide. So like a clock, some clouds. These are like very simple ones, um, a dessert a house over here on this side. And then as they progress throughout the books, um, it becomes more and more challenging. So for example, Alexia is in the level three book, which adds a lot more detail to each of the, the types of drawings. And then Elijah is in, I think book four, he's working a lot with like shading and different stuff like that at that level. So we've liked these a lot so far. They're simple, my kids pick up on it pretty easy. And it's just teaching them kind of the basics of looking at something and being able to draw it. All right, and last, but not least, we have handicrafts. So this year we had actually kind of planned out their handicrafts for the year. I had them look at the different things that we had available and just say, okay, what would you like to work on this year? What would you like to learn about? And so for these first couple weeks of school, Arwen is still working on embroidery, which she started last year. She just had a couple of projects that she still wanted to be able to do for that. And so that's what she's currently working on. But a friend of ours has also actually started teaching all of them how to crochet uh, all of them except for Aspen he's five he's not super interested in that yet cat so Arwen has actually been working on a little bit of like finger crochet type of projects as well which has been really fun for her and I'm glad that she's learning that sort of thing I was never able to actually like get the hang of crocheting and so I'm glad that there's someone else to teach her that's the beautiful thing about homeschooling like it doesn't even have to just be you you can pull in other friends and stuff to teach to teach them all kinds of things and that's something that just kind of naturally spurred up it wasn't something that we chose when we were first talking about handicrafts and so that's where it's kind of good to be go with the flow and just see where opportunities arise too but i always like to have a backup plan just in case so a lot of our backup plans actually came out of the wild and free handcrafts book so there's lots of ideas in here for different things that your children can learn how to do this is especially i would say geared more toward younger children so um there wasn't a whole lot in here that my oldest was necessarily interested in but everyone else wanted to do some stuff out of here so this book actually groups things by seasons, which makes it really helpful because a lot of the things that you're doing in this book are things that you're gathering from nature. And so it helps to know which season is best for gathering those things. One of the first that she'll be working on from this book is summer lanterns. So there's going to be some sort of paper mache ish type of work that goes along with this one. So she'll be um, learning how to do that. Some other things that she'll do throughout the year, she wants to do like wind chimes and building a fairy house and just different little like cute things like that. And then for later on in the year when it's like more cold out, there'll be like needle felting and stuff like that, that they'll be working on here in the house. There are different things that they wanted to do um, specifically to make Christmas presents for people that they love and also do water coloring uh, to make Christmas cards as well to go along with it. So there's lots of just like cute little ideas for things in this book that don't have to be a super burdensome type of handicraft. Sometimes when you start looking into handicrafts, it seems like, I'm going to have to learn so much stuff just to help my kids do this. And that's not always the case. And so there's some really good ideas for stuff in here. I'll also kind of just quickly mention, but I'll talk about it more in Elijah's video. Even there's like some certain wood carving tools that are more kid friendly that you don't have to necessarily worry about them hurting themselves as much that you can look into just different things like that too, that it's like, you don't necessarily have to learn the skill, but your child can still have access to the tools and the ability to kind of learn for themselves as well. So it's as complicated or as simple as you wanna make it. All right, but I think that that is all that I have for you guys today. If you have any questions, you can totally drop them down in the comments. I would love to connect with you guys. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more content like it, and I will catch you guys next time. Bye.